Hi, and uh, welcome to this Lunch Bites discussion, the second discussion in London. And uh, thank you all for coming here today. So this discussion is part of a European project in seven cities, namely Amsterdam, Dublin, Copenhagen, Helsinki, Glasgow, London, and Stockholm. I think I've got them all. And um, Lunch Bites discussions are being organized throughout 2014. The project will um, be concluded with a symposium in Berlin in 2015. It is um, initiated by the Goethe Institute, but always uh, organized in close collaboration with local institutions. And for the London series, we're working with the ICA, with the Digital Culture Unit of Goldsmith University, as well as Arcadia Mesa. Um, today, we will be talking about digital infrastructures and the organization of space online. We have on the panel today um, Ben Vickers, Wendy Chun, Boris Goys, and Paul Neal. Unfortunately, Hannah Sautel, who was also announced as a speaker of today's panel, won't be able to join us today as she fell ill. I'm very sorry about that. So I'm just going to um, quickly introduce you to the speakers before I hand it over to you, Ben. Um, first, I'm going to read uh, Ben's bio. <laughs> um, ben Vicker is a curator, writer, network analyst, and technologist. Technologist, um, and he's currently uh, the curator of digital at the Serpentine Galleries. He co-runs Limazulu Project Space, participates in the Near Now Fellowship Program, and is an active member of the distributed think tank. Edge writers. Right now, he lives and worships in the ancient city of Matera, southern Italy, where he facilitates I'm sorry, the open source development of An Monastery, a new civically minded social space based on contemporary mon monastic principles. <laughs> and then Moving on, uh, on the panel today, um, Wendy Chun. Wendy Chun is professor and chair of modern culture at media and media at Brown University. She has studied both systems design engineering and English literature, which she combines and mutates in her current work on digital media. <coughs> She's author uh, of Control and Freedom, Power and Paranoia in the Age of Fiber Optics, and programmed visions, software, and memory, next to many articles and essays. She is currently working on a monograph entitled Imagined Networks. And then, uh, Boris Geis. Boris Geis is an art critic, media theorist, and philosopher. He is currently a global distinguished professor of Russian and Slavic studies at New York University and senior research fellow at the Karlsruhe University of Arts and Design in Karlsruhe, Germany. He's the author of many books, including The Total Art of Stalinism, Art Power, The Communist Postscripts, and most recently, Going Public. And then, last but not least, um, Paul Neal. Paul Neal is an artist who lives and works in London. He received his MFA from the Slade School of Fine Art in 2011, and has lectured at the Department Kunst und Medien at Zürcher Hochschule der Künste in Zürich. He has participated in shows at the first Biennale Online, representing the UK, Plaza Plaza, and or Gallery, and Lima Zulu London. His work has also been featured on uh, Lunch Bites online exhibition space uh, called Platform. Um, yes, with that, I would like to hand over to Ben. But before, I would like to thank everybody involved uh, who was um, part of organizing this event mainly Eva Schmidt and um, Mario Schroff from the Goethe Institute, then Rosha Farkas and Tom Clarks from Arcadia Missa, as well as Matthew Fuller from the Goldsmith University, and of course, Rosalie Duval from the ICA. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna give a little introduction. So, uh, 
to start and considering the title of this talk, Structures and Textures, Digital Infrastructures and the Organization of Online Space, um, I think it's important to note a lot has been said in recent years, perhaps too much, that suggests that we have experienced a total upheaval and a collapse of the status quo. A digital revolution has occurred. A change that is often attributed to everyone's favorite thing, the internet. However, given the implications of this change and the suggestion of a total shift in spectatorship, it can at times seem a little difficult to conceive of or even feel at a guttural level that this has actually happened. When it comes to the impact and reorganization of space, it can be a struggle to stomach the rhetoric one is being shoveled. Despite our shiny and new technological infrastructure, we still find ourselves in the same familiar settings, with the same formats, sat in an event space, in an art gallery, with the experts that matter sat on stage, broadcasting their ideas to an audience of greater number. In a moment like this, it's fair to ask what has really changed? Or to ask the question, what has the infrastructure that underpins my daily interactions with the world done for the quality of my life recently? It could be suggested that what is actually different is the layering, the stack-like qualities to our experience of this room, above and beyond the typical grid infrastructure that keeps us so gracefully living and breathing, on top of which sits another layer, a conversation distributed in waves and facilitated by a hashtag or not. A conversation that can at once make irrelevant or amplify the words that are spoken on this stage. This scenario is not dissimilar to the objects found outside this room. There's a natural antagonism between the relevance of contemporary art daily's aggregation and the ICA's programming. And it's something that certainly can be called into question. But with a deficit of sovereignty ter sovereign territory for the internet, this space has at least the potential to be subsumed and owned by the technology that resides within it. Whether it be a gallery, library, museum, or bus stop, it's fair to say that institutional integrity is increasingly undermined or under threat by the encroachment of a network of humans and their tools. This sort of thing evidently raises some significant questions for art, probably, and our everyday lives, which likely be the concern of today's <coughs> discussion and presentations. And questions which arise may be things like, which comp computational processes are at work as we inhabit and traverse our networked environments? Or how do the art world's traditional spaces, such as the gallery or the museum, relate to the networked environment, and what roles do they have to play in the current moment? Or how long in time is this infrastructure and its interfaces likely to remain visible? And can an artist's work meaningfully, meaningfully intervene in the systems of control that constitute our networked environments? The obsessions and interests of artists is a curious one. Never before has the infrastructural backbone of our existence been so compelling, whether it be the White Mountain data center in Stockholm or the supply chain of conflict minerals for our smartphones. Infrastructure is really hot right now. It's cool to reflect upon it, in a way that the water sanitation plants that deal with our collective shit and other cultural grid infrastructure have never quite been so compelling, which in itself signals an interesting shift in the discussion of, the, of immateriality in our, or lack thereof. With the slow bleed of networked com communications and visualized means of display, a new infrastructural tree is upon us. We now face a new era of the internet inside everything. With the creation of the first smart cities, the advent of smart property, and the internet of things rapidly taking over our living rooms, the conversation, obvious risks, and an inadvertent glee with which these de devices will likely enter our lives poses fundamentally problematic questions about the quality and effect of our infrastructure and how said infrastructure tends to reorganize the way we use space. Placing today's presentations and discussions at crucial juncture for understanding how the world will be shaped over the next century. So with that said, I'll pass it over to Wendy. Mm -hmm. um. So thank you very much, and I want to start by um, thanking the organizers and also warning you. I, I had to get up at 4.30 to make it here today, so I don't know if I'm under-caffeinated or over-caffeinated. So things might be a little jittery at times as we move between the two caffeinated levels. Um, so I want to use my 15 minutes today to raise some questions about and through software, um, more importantly about and through what we perceive software to be and do. Then with this in place, um, I want to think about new media as fundamentally leaky, 
Um, so new media is mattering um, most basically. So today I want to argue that new media matter most in terms of how they structure our relationship to what is unknown or unknowable. Um, so to make this a little more concrete, um, let me start by analyzing all this wonderful traffic around us um, that is caressing my computer and us as we speak. Um, so, sweetie, what happened to you? See, this is what happens when you start talking about pressing computers. Oh, no, oh, wait. Okay, so the, the internet just went down, right? Okay. Well, this is what she did to me personally before you came in, so it's always good to have stuff here. So right before she decided that she did not like you all, um, this was all that she was um, uh, sending back and forth. Um, now, some of you may think that your computer only sends and receives um, packets as your, at your request, but as you can see, however, I was not doing anything except throwing papers around, um, and uh, yet my computer was constantly sending and receiving data. Um, now, I said that you're seeing um, all the data that was sent to um, and by my computer, but I lied. Um, because even though my computer, my network card acts promiscuously, um, it was not in promiscuous mode, right? Um, so your network card operates by downloading all the traffic it can and then actively deleting what's not directly addressed to it, right? Think about it, that's the only way it could work, right? So if you're, and tellingly, promiscuous mode, not monogamous mode, is a technical term, right? If your computer was monogamous, you would never get anywhere, right? So, um, and, and so promiscuous mode actually doesn't change how your computer normally operates. It just, um, it just doesn't write forward, right, the packets to its CPU, right? So monogamy in networks is through ignorance, right? Monogamy, ignorance. Um, now it's actually illegal for me to show you um, the traffic on your computer. Because in the UK, it's illegal for me to run a packet sniffer on your computer, right? So it's illegal for me to know what your computer is doing. It's illegal for us to know how our computers are constantly reading and writing each other. Now, in the past, I've used um, my um, packet sniffer um, to ask uh, the following network analyzer to ask the following question, right? So. Namely, given how promiscuous and open our machines are, um, why do we think of them as personal? Why do we think of them as enclosed and enclosing? Right? How has such a compromising mode of communication been bought and sold as empowering? Right? And um, further, I've asked, um, why do so many people, usually when I show um, the, the network traffic, most people get really paranoid, right? Um, so why do most people react to their um, gregarious, their wonderfully gregarious network cards um, with paranoia rather than thinking, of course, there needs to be this constant exchange of information in order for the network to operate? Um, before, um, but I start with this um, network analyzer to ask another question which is namely, um, given that computers generate visuals rather than represent what simply exists, right? given that computers compute, um, <clears throat> why do we actually believe my network analyzer was analyzing traffic? Right? Why do we believe um, what is on our interfaces? Right? Um, and if you think about it, it's really strange um, the ways in which software and knowledge have, have come together, like knowledge, technologies, et cetera, et cetera. Because what does it mean to know software, right? And how is it that software has become a privileged way, if not the privileged way, of understanding um, the visible effects of the invisible, right? So if you think about it, it's really strange that software, um, computers that understood as software and hardware machines have become metaphors for knowledge, for how our bodies, and for how society works, right? So the computer has become a metaphor for our bodies, genes, our programs. They've also become a metaphor for individuals and societies. You know, people talk about being wired certain, certain, certain ways, right? But the clarity 
um, offered by software as metaphor, as a metaphor for metaphor itself, should also make us pause, right? Because who really knows what's happening behind our interfaces, right? Who really knows what's happening with our software? So I'm trained as an engineer, and I can tell you theoretically at every level what your computer is doing, but I can't tell you right now what my computer is doing as it smiles so nicely at us. Um, as our machines disappear, getting flatter and flatter, the density and the opacity of their computation increases. The less we know, the more we're shown. Right? The less we can know, the friendlier our machines get. And importantly, in computer speak, a trusted machine is a machine that is secure from user intervention. Right? Um, now, it's important to realize that this paradox is not an unfortunate thing, right? Rather, it grounds computing's appeal, right? So the computer's combination of what can be seen and not seen, what can be known and not known, um, its separation of interface from algorithm, software from hardware, makes it a powerful metaphor for everything we believe is invisible yet generates visible logical effects, right? from genetics um, to the market um, to ideology or culture itself. Um, so my point today is not simply or mainly um, to reveal the bizarre and illogical intertwining of computers we can't understand with understanding itself, right? My point is not simply or mainly to reveal the ways that software as metaphor fundamentally changes what metaphor does, right? Metaphor usually explains something unknown through what's known, not something unknown through what's unknowable, right? Rather, my point is to invite us to think through um, how this intertwining of rationality with mysticism, knowability with what is unknown, grounds computation's appeal making it a powerful fetish that offers its programmers and users alike a sense of empowerment, right? A small s sovereign subjectivity that covers over just barely um, a profound ignorance. That is, I think there's something really intriguing about our machines as metaphor machines, especially if we take seriously the notion of metaphor as transition, right? As putting things in transit. Um, Indeed, we could argue that new media, if it's fundamentally anything, um, is fundamentally about leaks. Right? Now, to say that new media um, is about leaks isn't saying much. We're all aware, of course, of the NSA wiretapping program and the outrage that it has engendered, um, especially in Germany, where I am now. Right? Um, now I'm I'm hardly an apologist for the NSA, um, but I must say I'm completely baffled by the responses to Snowden. Right? I'm completely baffled because um, what we should be surprised by is not the fact that things leak, but rather that we ever thought things didn't leak. Right? Um, the fact that the NSA downloads all data Metadata should have surprised no one, um, in part because it's much easier to download and store everything and then filter through it later, and also in part because there were revelations about this um, since at least 2006, right, documenting exactly what was going on. Um, so new media is not simply about leaks. New media is leak. New media are leaky, right? New media work technically and socially by breaching and thus bizarrely sustaining the boundary between public and private, right? New media is wonderfully creepy. New media is wonderfully creepy. Um, and it's wonderfully creepy because our devices work by leaking. So your cell phone, your cell phone receives the same signal as mine. Your cell phone communicates with your microwave. Your cell phone, your microwave, um, communicate and disrupt my signal. Your signal is my noise, right? But our devices are deceptively sealed, right? Deceptively personal. Why do we ever even consider these leaking devices to be personal devices, right? And here, for instance, um, you see a listing, uh, although, yeah, it should at least be able to still show um, all my uh, 
a listing of all my open ports. Um, virtual ports open legitimately um, by some programs and arguably um, probably illegitimately by others, right? But even seemingly sealed, not connected, our computers constantly leak. They constantly write to read, read to write, <coughs> erase to keep going. And again, um, this leaking is not accidental, it's central. Without this leaking, there would be no communication. Indeed, without this constant leaking, there would be no digital media to begin with. Right? Um, because now, in order to remain, nothing remains so that nothing remains even as everything does. Right? Information is curiously undead, constantly regenerating. And we save things if we do by making um, the ephemeral endure. Right? We save things if we do by taking things that can actually last for a while, like paper, and making them more ephemeral. Um, more ephemeral, not simply because of physics, not simply because um, of uh, the fact that uh, paper mass lasts much longer than electromagnetic <coughs> signals, um, but also because of our constantly changing, constantly degrading um, machinic networks. That mean that anything we want to remain um, and to be read cannot simply remain, right? So some combination of us are in our machines must constantly re-migrate, regenerate. And this is perhaps why we do something that was at least um, in English considered impossible, right? We now store things in memory, right? We don't store memory traces, right? We store things in memory. Memory has become storage. But traditionally, they were two different things. People stored things, to store is for the future, right? And memory, memory was the painful and baneful <coughs> act of remembering. It was something that was remembered, not a place where things were stored. And I don't have to get uh, time to get into this, um, but this conflation of memory and storage lies at the heart of modern computation. So with von Neumann machines, with his abstraction of function from machine, memory from store, with von Neumann, computers became nervous human machines, and the outside world, the outside world for von Neumann became dead storage. Um, but again, computers work by leaking. Our networks constantly leak. Right? So even though every hard connection happens through a sexualized, heterosexual connection, right? so there are male to female connectors everywhere, um, and here you see a little play with that um, from a Brazilian plug site. Um, but I have to tell you, I was really horrified when as a nice young Korean-Canadian girl you know, doing engineering, I finally realized what all my computers were doing. Right? all those male to female connectors everywhere. And for a while, I was afraid to touch my keyboard. <laughs> it was the same thing when I was in grad school and all my other grad student friends started getting pregnant and I refused to use the photocopier. Because um, you can't tell me <laughs> reproduction's not contagious, right? Okay, so, but even seemingly sealed in this hard connection, um, however insulated, um, every line leaks, every line generates noise. Right? Um, so since I'm out of time, let me just end by noting that this leaking happens not simply at a technological level, but also at the political and cultural level as well. Because what is a friend, especially a Facebook friend, if not a potential leak? Thank you. made the mimetic function of the traditional art obsolete 
and thus pushes this art in a different, actually opposite direction, opposite to my Instead of reproducing and representing the images of nature, art became to dissolve, deconstruct, and transform these images, shifting the attention from the image itself to the analysis of the image production and presentation. The same can be said uh, about the art museum today. The internet made its function to represent mimetically the art history obsolete. Of course, one can argue that in the case of the internet, the spectators lose the direct access to the original artwork, but we do not believe into the original anyway. Uh, uh, but Benjamin told us that all the uh, museum's items are already, uh, are already copies of themselves, and was the aura through the act of uh, museumification itself. So nothing happens when this uh, reproduction uh, uh, is uh, a habit of the internet and through digitalization. So many critical, uh, many cultural critics have uh, expected and still expect actually that public art museums will ultimately disappear, being unable to compete economically with obviously private collections and private collectors operating on the increasingly expensive art market and become substituted by my cheaper, more accessible virtual digitalized archive. That is actually uh, what uh, many young artists hope for, also, especially in non-Western co uh, countries, uh, to disseminate uh, the art directly through internet instead of going the very long way of evaluation through the museums and galleries. However, the relationship between internet and museum radically changes. The museum begins to be understood not as a storage of, uh, for the artwork, but as a stage for the flow of art events. Indeed, today, the museum ceases to be a space of contemplation, uh, in general, not, not only artworks. Uh, it begins to be a place where things happen. The events that are staged by the museum are mostly temporary curatorial projects or installations. But the contemporary museum is also a place of lectures, conferences, readings, screenings, concerts, guided tours, etc. The flow of events inside the museum is today often faster than outside its walls. Meanwhile, we got a customer to ask ourselves what is going on in this and that museum. The question that was uh, absurd only some decades ago. To find the relevant information about what is going on. We search for it on the websites of the museum, but also in blogs, social media pages, on Twitter, etc. We do not so often visit a museum if we follow its activities on the internet. So museum became kind of block. And it is block that tells its own history. So it tells the history, history of the museum, or the story of what happens with the museum, and not the universal art history anymore. And we have to do, uh, that is maybe the second aspect I want to speak about. So one is turning art spaces from place of contemplation to the place of event. Uh, the second uh, uh, change is a shift from reproduction uh, to documentation. Uh, because uh, traditional uh, dissemination of the artwork went through the production, and we, we see already, uh, of course, our productions also in the, on the internet. Uh, but basically, if what we are confronted with in the art spaces are events and not objects, then it is impossible to reproduce them. And so all the, all the discourse about the uh, relationship uh, between original and reproduction became obsolete. We rather um, document these events. Yeah? And we do not uh, expect 
any homology or any mimetic relationship uh, between original and, and copy. So if, for example, uh, traditional artwork, like traditional painting, uh, being documented, uh, being reproduced, created something like an illusion of eternity, illusion of transtemporal existence, illusion that was criticized uh, by the philosophy and art criticism of 20th century uh, in many ways and on many levels, today uh, we are confronted with completely different case. Uh, today we are confronted mostly with documentation. So we go to the museum and we see one documentation after another. Yeah? Documentation of performances, of long-term artistic projects, maybe still unfinished uh, happenings, uh, curatorial projects, former curatorial projects, and so on and so on, from different parts of the world. And if we look at them, when we look at them, we think, oh, how, how pity yeah, that I see only this documentation. How wonderful uh, would be present at the original event. Yeah? So if uh, a reproduction uh, was a machine for production of illusion of uh, eternity, now uh, documentation of the museums uh, create illusion of the past. I, I, I say illusion of the past. Uh, because it's like, you know, if you go to a football play, uh, uh, I never was there, uh, but it's how I mentioned it. Yeah, you know, uh, yeah, no, culture imagination. So you see some kind of un 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 uh, uncomfortable place and you don't see anything, and there's a lot of noise and people point one direction or another. And so you actually don't get anything that happens here on the field. So you to understand what, what happened before, you, you, you have to see the documentation. All my friends who go to the, to, to the football games do that. So they look at, uh, at the record, you know, at the record uh, home, at their, uh, at their screens. So uh, in fact, this uh, presence in the past, or the past presence, uh, is an illusion. If we would be there, we wouldn't see anything. So what I documentation produces in our mind is an illusion of a possibility of the presence in the past. Yeah? And that is very interesting shift in our relationship to our presentation in general. And maybe the third point. Okay, I have one. So third point is this one. What happened? To the spectator. I think to the spectator uh, as a human being, a very interesting thing happened. If you go to the museum and if you look at a painting uh, and your gaze is moving on the surface of the painting, it doesn't leave any trace. So your presence could not be traced and could not be checked and the movement of your gaze cannot be repeated. That is actually uh, something like an empirical, uh, empirical reason uh, for ontological difference between subject and object. Yeah? This uh, non-correlation between subject and object has to do with subject leaving no trace on the object it looks at. But if you look at some image in the internet, your movement of your gaze, and you're clicking this image, you're making this image bigger, uh, then going to the fragment, yeah, operating with the fragment, so on. All these operations, so operation of seeing, yeah, operation of subjective operation, uh, are recorded and cannot be repeated, yeah. And uh, there are surveys also. So in the internet, you, you have also production of, uh, of contemplation. Uh, contemplation uh, becomes active practice that can be traced, uh, is traced, and can be also repeated. That is what happened to the human. Uh, that is a half of the thing 
that happen to the human spectator. The second half, you cannot be an informed art spectator if you use the internet. Because obviously if you use the internet, you only follow the websites of your friends. Yeah? Or maybe uh, a famous museum. Yeah? Or maybe I see it. Yeah? <laughs> but that's it. Yeah? But even if I follow I see a couple of my friends, I do not have uh, a basis uh, of uh, conversation. I am not a conversant. Yeah, why? Uh, because uh, an informal judgment, informal art historical art history judgment, is based on comparison. Comparison among all possible or all available artworks and images. Only if I have this kind of overview and I I am able to, to compare all the elements of this overview, all the individual authors, I can say one is better, one is worse, one's more interesting, it, it looks like this, that is originally new, that is old and obsolete, and so on. So I, I can make a, 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 a judgment. So who can make a judgment now? Uh, theoretically, it could be good, obviously, because human being is impossible to see all the images on the internet, yeah, obviously. Not only art images, but also all these images uh, on the Facebook, all these billions and billions of images, they are unaccessible for a human being. So <coughs> who, who is next after God is obviously an algorithm, yeah? So art historical and art critic uh, is now not a human being, but an algorithm uh, of type uh, an essay algorithm of, uh, or 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 uh, Google. So instead of criticizing an essay, and instead of uh, instead of criticizing Google, one has to develop something like a parallel system of total overview uh, and algorithmic conversation. Yeah. That would be a return to the traditional art history. So we, we have as a normative uh, gaze, not a gaze. Not a human gaze, not a divine gaze, like uh, medieval art, uh, but a new kind of gaze. Uh, it's algorithmic gaze. And all art we do, we do for the algorithm and not for the humans. that um, I have live published in a Google Doc on my website and they're in a way just a response to sometimes feeling like I've got a lot of ideas and not the desire to always flesh them out into full-blown essays so they're just something between an aphorism and a missive and they always start with um, a tweet something from Twitter that has been condensed and then kind of unpacked again. Plausible reference. The scope of things that are easily accepted as reference points in contemporary artworks. This may include subjects such as technology, surface, subjectivity, performativity, networks, abstraction, ennui, classicism, design, nature, and ecology, psychology, sex, critical theory, text, and others. In a limited sense, these plausible references are subjects which may escape their perception as subjects aiding in the creation of a light or open atmosphere in the work or installation. Unique dramaturgic interiors. The approach to exhibiting artworks championed by blogs such as Contemporary Art Daily, where the dramatic staging of the exhibition within an architectural space is itself the subject and focus of the digital images that document it. This approach is differentiated from what was formerly called installation art to the extent that there is not necessarily a reflexive or critical dimension to the engagement of the architecture, and also that the staging is optimized for photographic reproduction rather than a physical experience of the work. 
this work is aware of its ultimate transmission as digital image and often has a, quote, minimal or sparse composition in order to not be overpowering when viewed in the browser environment where it will be inevitably flanked by banner ads and open programs on one's personal computer. This work makes space for advertising. There's also a subtle but significant attention to the specific details of the architectural space that encode it as one particular gallery or another. Rather than neutralizing the historical context of the architecture as the white cube approach to exhibition spaces initially envisioned, unique dramaturgic interiors give us the feeling of specificity, but one that is emotionally restrained, a well-trained servant whose dignity becomes a regulating presence in the background environment of the enlightened decor. Um, so now, what did I do with that flicker? There it is. So, um, so I'm an artist, and I'm gonna. These are some pictures of um, stuff that I've done. Tell you a bit about it. This first one um, is um, just a picture of a pile of books that I made, um, titled Paul Mill Poems. Um, and this was um, a work that I made in uh, actually in my degree show at the Slate. I should start timing it because I don't know how long I've been here. Um, so I think a lot of the things that I thought I would try and pull out to talk about today are things that have some kind of crossover between networks and the psychological states and the, and the productive attitudes that come out of networks and the way that, for me, those things don't escape materiality but actually um, are very rooted in materiality, but it's a, it's a specific materiality that is attendant to the, to the subjects and the environments that are now engaged in a cycle with those networks. So, um, yeah, so this is a piece that I made when I was out of money at uh, school. I'd spent all my uh, loans on tuition. And I was um, making a photocopy one day. And, um, <laughs> and the photocopier just kept uh, spitting out free photocopies. So um, I thought that was pretty cool. And I reverse engineered the process through trial and error. And I eventually figured out, um, this was in the UCL library, um, that, that the machine down at the end here, where you recharge your card, you have to put the, um, you have to put it on a 20p increment. So I discovered that if you put one pound 20 on the card, then went to the first black and white machine, made three black and white coffees for five cents each, that put the value down to one pound five, then you would eject the card, take it down to the uh, final full color photocopier, and the first copy that you made had to be full color A3, and that cost a pound. Um, but there was a glitch because the card reader was meant to eject the card when you had 10p left on it. So you were able to, you were able to make the copy because you had enough on the card, but it didn't know how to understand that there was only 5p left. <laughs> so <laughs> it would just keep um, spitting copies and copies out. Um, at, at one pound a side. Um, so I got a significant portion of my tuition refunded to me <laughs> by that. Um, I made an addition of a of hundred of these um, and gave them away for free in my degree show. And the actual, so that, and then the uh, content are these um, poems that are written um, composed out of like news blogs where all of the information is kind of de-hierarchized, if that's a word, uh, there's probably a better one. Um, but that's something that's, um, that's something that's native to the kind of uh, material format of the news online because you don't have the physical structure of front page, second page, back page that has all of these socialized uh, you know, hierarchies attended to it. So you get you know, some Iraq war uh, stuff right next to celebrity news. Um, so these are poems that are composed out of the um, headlines and bits of text that come from those. And the images are uh, CD cases. But there's a bunch of different CD cases. I don't know if anybody's ever noticed this, but there's not this one quality of CD case. If you go to Ridley Road and you buy the, the Nigerian DVDs, they have a much crappier um, DVD case that they come in, um, which I thought was funny because I'm sure, they're, I'm sure they're all made in China, but 
there's got to be like one factory somewhere that makes like really crappy cases and then one factory that makes like the regular cases which is still kind of crappy but there were all these kind of insane tranches within the crappy <laughs> Um, this is the front page of a, of a Juarez site, not mine, um, but I just I thought this is maybe relevant to just throw in there um, in relation to the discussion that we're having today. Um, I don't know if anybody was ever um, a BBS uh, system admin, but um, when I was like <laughs> when, 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 when I was like 11 years old, um, in suburban Canada, this was um, a fun thing to do. Um, so these these were basically um, a kind of proto internet or or kind of parallel internet uh, system that worked on like dial up phone lines, and you had to request um, permission to access. And often, only like in the early ones, only one user at a time could be actually on the on the, the site, and you had to host it on your own computer as well um, and these were basically I mean the site the site that me and uh, my friend Paul Cheevers ran was mostly uh, hacked credit cards uh, softcore porn and bomb making manuals um, <laughs> all stuff that um, yeah um, <laughs> it's, it's ten year old stuff um, but I think what was interesting to bring up was that I was still thinking about and working with was these kind of text-based, uh, kind of handmade or, or kind of uh, countercultural types of constructions and using the ability of the, of the ability to connect with uh, people anonymously to structure these things, but also that, that anonymous spectator did also constitute an audience. And um, I think it wasn't until I started finding art magazines at the uh, at the mini mall uh, corporate bookstore that I realized there's another um, form of audience out there that you could access through art. Um, okay, so yeah, so this is kind of um, coming along from Juarez. This is a show that I did at the Art Gallery of Ontario in January, and the title of the show was Be Random, which is um, the name of uh, the most infamous board from the website uh, 4chan.org. Um, and again, this board is mostly full of really um, terrible stuff. But I think what is most interesting there is the way that there is um, a hyper-specific insider language that's set up um, that seems to be as much this, that the perpetuation and the variation of this language seems to be as much the subject of what's going on as whichever um, meme or whatever is actually um, going on there. Um, and to me that was quite an interesting parallel for the way that I thought that art systems were working today that with the presupposition of a, of a shared um, kind of hermetic language that was essentially accessible to uh, outsiders or non-specialists, but also really retained certain secrets or definitely outed people as being um, newbies or tourists. Um, so I composed like a simulacrum of my studio from London here in the, in the museum space where they had actually just had a traveling uh, David Bowie show, the same one that was um, at the uh, V&A in London, and I just got them to leave all the crap that had been left over from the Bowie exhibition, and then brought in all these um, different printers and um, different productive stuff that I'm working with in my studio, um, and set that up like that, and there was live feeds, um, some, at the opening some people appeared on the live feed, and yeah, that was that show. Um, this is another, this is a show that I did at um, Ben's and, uh, and uh, other people's uh, collectively run uh, Space Lima Zulu uh, in London. Um, and the thing about Lima Zulu, if you don't know, is it also has this kind of like 
um, network identity, um, which is, again, visible and comprehensible to insiders and maybe also to outsiders, but um, has, a, has a certain specific politic um, and is kind of island of that uh, politic, which, which is a politic that I um, would feel a, a lot in common with. Um, without generalizing the positions that people have there, but um, so uh, I wanted, you know, um, to get investigated for stuff by the Met, um, and so I wanted to kind of troll them uh, and to try and look at the relationship of this politic within the greater context of the of the culture in London, which, um, as an outsider to me, is always represented by this incredible wealth of tabloids, um, these really nasty um, tabloids that are everywhere. So f every day for a month, I delivered all of these daily tabloids to them. And then while I was there, I worked with the, um, I worked with the papers and um, their photocopier that they had there and made some pieces that I thought reflected um, some of the attitudes that they and I shared along with them yeah, all like lifestyle. Um, and there's another one that said, uh, last ditch heaven flop house that I don't think I have a photo of. And then I also collected some of them and kept them in, kept them in garbage bags full of um, acid and paint thinner and a bunch of noxious chemicals that they started to dissolve in. Um, so this is um, an exhibition that I did at V22 um, this summer. The title of this was Dream Jacking, Cool Hole, Lust for Like. And again, those were three titles that came out of my um, Twitter account. And I used a 3D modeling software called Google SketchUp, which is freeware. Um, it's, a, it's a crappy 3D modeling program. Um, I guess I was thinking about how that's often used as a kind of default way to make a model for an exhibition rather than making a physical model. So I kind of turned that around and reproduced like the aesthetic of the model maker in uh, in a physical scenario, including this like big chunk wall that's kind of plonked there at a at a not quite right angle, um, and these texts that are extracted from the three D um, program and then turned into vectors and laser cut and um, so the whole thing has a feeling of this bad uh, SketchUp model. And it's also got all the different production stages, so all of the stuff that was used in the exhibition is piling up in trash bags along the bottom. That's a detail. This is um, something from a project that I did for Lunch Bites. Um, with Melanie and uh, on the platform, how does that work? It, it's platform by Lunch Bites? Yeah. Okay. Um, so this work came around after I just had a studio visit with two uh, curators from Beijing, and they were telling me about how all of their um, data, well, they, they were suspecting, this was before the NSA, so we, we were having a talk about how they you know, always thought they were getting basically, you know, spied on, and that when we had email communications, like, you shouldn't say anything bad about the Chinese government or this, this kind of level of thing. Um, and I was thinking about how these systems work physically, and obviously you don't have somebody sitting there reading um, every transmission or looking at every image. You have algorithms that read the content and look for keywords, and then it's going to be looked at by a human. So I came up with this idea of making this uh, uh, like um, visual encryption, this cryptogif. It's like a reverse like captcha. So it's something that's meant to be unreadable to a computer. Obviously a human can read it, but it's just kind of like sand in the Vaseline of the of the hoovering process. It requires it requires um, human eyes to read it. So it's made it's just the GIF that's made with multiple video layers, like a nice, busy background of some um, graffiti, and then the text unfolds over top of it um, in time. So also, if you open the, if you open the GIF um, as individual image files, then 
you also can't read the whole thing. So it really requires somebody to look at it to be read. And then I made that for Lunch Bites in a website, and there's also a video that I appropriated, the, like how-to YouTube video style, which I'm sure is how everybody's learned to do a lot of stuff. It's really great whenever you have like a tough problem. There's a really smart nine-year-old on YouTube <laughs> who can tell you how to do it. Um, so I, I kind of like appropriated that style and explained how to make these. Um, so that's, and that's available on the site. Um, how am I doing for time? Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm almost done. Tell me if you're bored. Um, so this is, um, this is a project that I did, um, again with Ben, actually. Um, you can guess who invited me. Um, for the uh, online Biennale, which was um, a project that sounded like it was going to be interesting, and it was for the most part. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it was a, yeah, I mean, uh, the, idea, uh, the idea was to have a, a Biennale that was structured online and presented works that I assume that dealt with the uh, theoretical or material context of networks or the internet or something close to that. Um, that wasn't necessarily what they had anticipated. Um, and the structure that they wanted to use to present it was limited to a fairly standard um, kind of like um, user interface. Um, so I ended up making, I decided that I would make these ebooks. So these ebooks are kind of a massive exercise in uh, kind of redundancy, but also um, a reshuffling of the, of the typical order between the technological interface and the, and the material interface. So they're again made out of my Twitter feed, but um, I just, when Twitter made um, your archive available, I just downloaded it and cut out like 2,000 tweets by hand and then reordered them into different kind of flows and logics um, and just taped them into a, a little book with eight four sheets folded together and then photocopied them and then scanned them. And then that's, so there's two books and that's the first book. Um, and then, so, yeah, so, so they're just these little texts, but it also cuts across the, the time flows because the, the, the time signature is always stamped on the tweet. So it was interesting for me to see kind of how these thoughts and the structure that I've used as like a public notebook had different kind of cadences that you could draw out or reorganize. And then the second, um, the second book is just the same process, but I re-photographed all the scanned images on the computer with the phone that I originally sent out all the tweets with. So it kind of eats itself. Um, Gertrude say. Um, and then, so, sorry, this is the last thing we'll look at. This is um, a recent show that I did in London called um, Monet's Garden, Zuckerberg's Firewall. And I think I was thinking about the relationship between um, what artists are looking toward for, for inspiration or a subject between a kind of you know, fairly golden age seeming historical reference like Monet and then um, today. So these are a series of drawings that I make on the road using basically low-end technology like inkjet printers or photocopiers and also household chemicals that do different things to the inks and the toners and they combine bits of like found text and also text that I've sent out um, online and then they also get worked up into images that are like versions of the drawings rather than destinations or, or final or final versions. And that's it. Yep. Okay. Um, so 
I, I wanted to start by asking a question that's kind of been present. I, th I feel like ev almost every public talk I've been to, and this might say something like a bias about the kind of talks that I go to, but there's like, the NSA is always in the background. Um, and <laughs> I kind of wanted to bring it up so that we don't end up talking about the NSA a lot. Um, but I wanted to ask a really basic and naive question initially to you, Wendy. Of, um, why do you think the NSA runs these programs? Why do I think the NSA runs these programs? Yeah. Um, I think, I, okay. I mean, I, I can back that up with something in a second, but I, I want okay. to ask you on that basis. Well, I think it's necessary for the logic of preemption. If you want to preempt something, then you have to um, have everything um she's working now we can put her up and you can see what she's doing if you want later um, but right now she's interfering with my microphone okay um so if you think about the logic of preemption and what a database signifies if you can't but the logic of preemption depends on you knowing the search terms right so you need to figure out what to search for before an event happens right um so Law enforcement, therefore, will always be at fault because after an event, the search terms are clear. Right? So part of what the NSA is trying to do is figure out the search terms um, before an event happens. Um, so that's one sort of logic it, it's involved in. Now, in terms of why does it store everything, um, partly within it, it, US law, they've said that it's legal to actually store metadata. And this has been legal for since the, the decision was in the 70s, right? So it was clear that they were doing this for a while. Um, and so there, the, 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 the thing is, it's much easier just to have everything and then search for the terms later once you have a subpoena saying that you can do it. Um, and say that because it's a computer, it's not humanly read, it's not read, right? And therefore, the question of the reading comes in. Um, and it's therefore just much easier to just download everything. Like, think back to um, the Wayback Machine. Does everyone know the Wayback Machine, right? So back in the day when it started, the Wayback Machine was only going to back up important websites, and that took too long, right? And so now they just back up everything, because actually having to filter as you store is more complicated. Um, and uh, the, the, there's this kind of like underlying uh, assumption that the NSA gathering all the data of the world and storing it is a bad thing. Um, I, I wonder if you can, if there are any grounds on which you could imagine it being uh, an ethically sound choice. So I, I could give two examples on which I could imagine it to be an ethically sound choice, but I just wondered whether you had any perspective on that. Or is it just abhorrent? See, what I think is far more interesting is the fact that we download each other's traffic all the time, but this is not visible to us. I think that if we actually took seriously the way networks work and our network cards work, we would have a different sense of what a network is. And I find the thing to be most appalling is this idea that somehow when you use a device, it's personal. And so therefore, I think things like Snapchat are really dangerous because they give the, the sense to these people, oh yeah, this is ephemeral, when that's the... <laughs> yes, that's that term. Um, so that's the, my question. And so I would like us to rethink what it means to be networked if we take seriously the sort of gregariousness and, and, and of our networks, rather than sort of focus on this idea that things should be um, monogamous. Why am I having problems saying that word? Um, this is not a personal reflection. Um, but rather than you know being locked up in this this logic of security, right? What if we actually took the pro the the the, um, the uh, public nature of our network seriously, and how would that actually change things? And how would it also intervene into the idea that everything should be stored, right? Just because we all sort of um, read each other's traffic doesn't mean that we need to store everybody's traffic, right? I think there's, there's, a, there's a decision that's made both politically and technologically to store things. And that's, that's a real question. You were say something? No, not very. OK, I, I mean, I won't, I, won't, <laughs> I won't follow up on exactly. Yeah, okay. No, <laughs> I won't go there. We go we go down a rabbit hole. So if we if if from this point we kind of drop NSA from the conversation, if that's any way possible. Um, I had a specific question 
for you, Boris, in terms of thinking, you, you talk about the internet as a kind of, uh, like almost like a, a hegemonic entity that uh, like ruptures uh, what was once like a, a localized regional um, way of experiencing art. And I, and, I, and I wonder where that comes from because my experience personally is of an internet that is highly fractured through a series of like localized communities. Um, and the art world actually has felt very hegemonic to me. And I, I just wondered in terms of clarification of that thought or I can misunderstood. I agree that is the case, yeah. It's how we use internet. Uh, structured, as, as I said, we have to follow our friends, yeah. But uh, ask the question what, uh, what happened to the museum. And the museum uh, that was created in the 18th century, 19th century, function 10th century, uh, was based on the idea of something like a universal universal image of image production, yeah? Something like a means to give you universal overview beyond your immediate uh, culture and beyond your immediate cultural fraction. And obviously, a uh, uh, museum doesn't do that anymore, yeah? But internet uh, offers itself as a possibility if you look at the internet as a museum, as an exhibition space. I mean, in general. Yeah. So, if you have a possibility to go through the book in Japan and look at the images one after another, then you have the same experience as you go through the book or beach museum, basically. Of course, uh, it's not necessary to do so, you can uh, always go only one stage, but you have this possibility. You have this possibility, but you don't have time because you are mortal, yeah. Um, so uh, we have to, we need something immortal, yeah? That, that, that. Uh, if we are not believers, yeah? so we're not, not, not going back into the uh, real age, then it is uh, obviously algorithmic. Uh, uh, algorithm. So algorithm can do that. It can do that fast. Uh, it is immortal, so it has no uh, uh, problems. And the algorithm can make uh, uh, informed uh, art historical art critical judgment. You know what, what I thought about it? Because uh, everybody visits like Biennale, you know, documentaries. And if you go out of the documentary space or Biennale space and you uh, talk to your friends and colleagues, and well, what do you think about that? The answer is now, no, I don't think anything about that. Yeah, simply because I didn't have enough time to look at everything. Or the videos were too long, yeah, also too, too much text, yeah. So maybe, and I'm very tired, yeah, and it's very hot, yeah. So maybe <laughs> I like drink a coffee, I go back, and then I go through all the stuff, and I get an informal judgment, yeah, and, and he or she never, never do that. So, so what, what is what? That, that's number one. Number two, that is very interesting is that the artists are working mostly in the internet also if they produce paintings, yeah, because they buy things, they travel, love affairs, everything goes to the internet through the same space. That means you have all, all uh, art history, art critical material, yeah. In the same place, you not only have art production, but also life of the artist, yeah. So you can, uh, you can write, um, you can write a book, uh, but not you, but the algorithm. So we, we, we have, we have in, to invent algorithm, a writing, art critical, and art historical books because art critics and art historians are not capable to do that anymore. <coughs> so something you can sympathize with. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was, I was, it was bringing up. Um, I mean, everybody, um, it's been, it's been kind of over discussed lately. This idea of the post-internet art, but. I reversed it in my own mind to something like uh, post art internet. That if art is a historical period, I mean, it certainly has a historical beginning. I mean, we know that you know um, the the way that we structure our understanding of a work through functions of authorship and uh, originality, etc. That that has a historical beginning point, even if it's not a sharp one. Um, 
that it could also have a historical conclusion. And if we're possibly at that point of conclusion, then maybe the thing that comes after it is just the internet, not this kind of backwards looking of how can we like reload um, this kind of old category with new variations and, er and iterations, but um, maybe just allowing that new experience to just kind of unfold on its own. Um, which also, I think, opens the potential that you might take the entire history of painting, say, as a kind of ready-made. Um, and that's something that I think about, this kind of whole breadth of gestures and possibilities as a kind of carrier system, as a kind of like discourse packet that can be taken and, and kind of worked with in this largely like a historical territory of production that we have now. May I say that I agree with you as a, as a the same direction. So we have the internet as a post post art reality. The only question is how we can aestheticize it. Yeah. How we are able to aestheticize internet so it's really functioning as post artistic uh, event. And I think we can do that only at least imagining something like a non-human view on the internet. Yeah? It's like, like in, uh, as, as this artistic idea started in the Middle Ages, yeah? people presuppose something like an ability of divine gaze, of God, infinite God, yeah? to aestheticize the earth, or to aestheticize the whole universe. Yeah? And that because they imagine such a possibility, they began to aestheticize parts of it, yeah, so there are some fragments. So we can aestheticize fragments of the internet only if we have this kind of transcendental illusion of the possibility of uh, aestheticizing internet in general. And this illusion can be created only by, 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 by kind of endowing algorithmic gaze with aesthetic function, yeah, so that, that's what that is. Um, and in terms of this idea of uh, the, the algorithm, again, as like some kind of discrete hegemonic thing, um, how, how, how does that kind of ring true in, in, in your experience of engineering and constructing algorithms and you know, the, the digression between uh, the idea of the algorithm and, and the kind of reality construct? Yeah, no, I mean, what's fascinating about algorithms is that they actually, um, von Neumann had a, a great um, phrase for it. It's sort of like marking out the boundaries of possibility. And, and Wiseman said, um, it's like a uh, legislative system. You put it in place, but you don't know exactly how it's going to execute. Um, so I think there's a fundamental uncertainty in terms of how things execute that is fascinating and intriguing in terms of if we're going to talk about this sort of algorithmic view. And I think that what's interesting about a lot of the, the new quote-unquote algorithms is that they're so statistical and they're so high level um, that even the notion of the sort of step-by-step -step notion of the algorithm is being challenged in really interesting ways. And so I think that, that even what is considered an algorithm now is, is changing precisely because of this quote-unquote deluge of data. And I think that the sort of, um, the really wonderful idiosyncrasies of execution um, are fascinating. And, you know, just when you were talking about the aesthetic view of the internet, first I was thinking, okay, so <coughs> aesthetics, traditionally was um, the perception of women and slaves, right? So now we have women, slaves, and machines. Um, but then also, in the way you were talking about um, the aesthetics made me think of, of robots, right? And the ways in which that sort of, in various webs work um, in the, uh, in, in the um, sort of database stuff like uh, Google. But it made me therefore think, what would this aesthetics be? Or how can we, because if it's, I don't know, I, I think that there's so much out there that goes to that question that you initially posed about the many, right? And think about something like BBSs, right? Did you actually keep all the log files from your BBS? Do you still have them or no? Yeah. 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 
<laughs> but I'm glad. Um, but I think that there's there's also uh, an aesthetic that's attendant to the to the physical systems that support um, algorithms or networks as well, which is always concealed um, because it has uh, ideological reason to be concealed. Um, but like last year, I was teaching a course in Zurich, and you know the magic of a university email uh, address. You can get people to let you in places. Uh, they think you're legit. Um, we got inside this crazy data center um, outside of Zurich, and it was the first time I'd been in a data center. Um, but, I mean, uh, it, it, it hosted, among other things, the HP cloud, uh, this data center. And I thought, what a, a terrible metaphor, uh, cloud. You know, there's nothing cloud-like about this data center. It's positioned, I mean, it's in Switzerland because it's a very secure and stable country. Um, it's located between two nuclear power stations. It has a direct, really, it has a direct feed from each nuclear power station. Um, their backup generator system is eight uh, large diesel generators, um, and in sets of two, they're all from different brands, so that if one um, company goes bust, it's not impossible to get parts for the other ones. And just this backup generator system had the capacity to generate electricity that they said would um, power 250,000 apartments. Um, so you're dealing with really a phenomenal uh, physical infrastructure. Um, it's not a cloud. And there's an aesthetic and also a, a political economy that surrounds those structures. Absolutely. If we got serious about global climate change, would we have these data centers? I mean, I think that there's... Uh, yeah, I mean, and, there, and data centers aren't necessarily required to report on, I mean, what kind of electricity they're using because they're they're privately held companies and you don't have to tell people what your electricity bill is. But obviously, especially in the United States where a lot of data centers are located, electricity is still 50% generated by coal power. So there really is like a material link between uh, profile views and, and burning coal. That's, it's not that abstract, even. I obviously, sorry. Yeah. Maybe my, uh, my attitude to the internet that formed uh, at the moment I saw, uh, uh, I went at the internet for the first time, to the beginning of the 90s, and was imme immediately interested in a huge website, My Cat. It was a very formalized one. I, th I think it, it functions until now. And there was a strong regulation, so you have an image of the cat, a description of the cat, and general characterization of the cat. And so you go from cat to cat, and every cat is very cute. Yeah? <laughs> and I immediately, I immediately saw how I, as onlooker, can establish the cutest of all the cats, yeah. <laughs> it is an operation, yeah, imaginable. So what does it mean, yeah, what does it, does it mean aesthetic appreciation of those cats? And the all already at that time, uh, 10,000 and so on and so And so I thought, it must be something good. It must be something that is in us or in a machine and so on, so on that transcends this simply cute cat to what is the cutest cat in the world, yeah? <laughs> which is not the same as statistically the most reproducible cat, yeah? because at the moment they believe the most statistically reproducible cat is most, but it's not most beautiful. It's not the cutest cat, as you know, it's kind of angry cat, yeah? <laughs> so so it's, it's, it's interesting, yeah? It's interesting to look how it works, yeah? So statistic is not quite what the individual attitude could be, but they intersect in a very different way. Well, I think that brings up the logic of optimization, right? And sort of Agri's argument that we're moving towards capture systems, which are based on grammars of action. And so immediately in the system, you're trying to game it. Like, what is the cutest cat? Um, so I think that there's something there in the, the, the methodology. But I also like what you said about documentation, because it strikes me as you were talking about aesthetics, that it's very much linked to that move towards documentation as well in terms of, of what's happening there. 
Yeah, no, I mean, um, I think we switched to Q&A, but, but I, there was just one thing I wanted to pick up on the documentation, and something that I've, I've wanted to ask in reading your text, because a lot of the time you write about uh, an, an older generation of artists that, although they have websites now, and you're originally writing some of the stuff that's like going public, um, those artists didn't have websites unless their studios produced them. But as a younger generation of artists, obviously everyone has a website to some degree. Um, I want in terms of that kind of idea of archival, what you think the effect is of a, of a young generation of artists kind of help self-historicizing themselves in the process of the production of like their, their work. So you have like 2009, 2010. Absolutely, because if you, if you, for example, if I'm invited to look at the work uh, of young artists uh, in New York from time to time, so I was in Chicago, an American, what you get uh, actually is this on one object that is laptop, yeah? And on this laptop, you see the history of participations, yeah? It's, it's, it's not individual artworks that is presented. It is every time uh, a documentation of a participation in a certain collective project, social project, uh, big exhibition, and so on and so on. So what you actually see is an analogy to academic CD with even less individual production because individual, yes, a CD uh, acquired or write a book or something like that, uh, which, which is, uh, which is still conservative here yeah, as an object. But here you have only this, a series of events. Yeah? And then you have to appreciate, is it event important or not? Was it important participation as an important event? Was it important participation as a not important event? Was it, <laughs> yeah? And then if you, uh, important in what sense? Uh, other people were important. Place was important, curator was important, date was important, and the country was important, or not. Yeah, so so you, you make all this kind of uh, calculation in your mind automatically, and it's like, it's like you go through the CD, yeah, if, 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 if the application of the university. So, yes. And it's almost uh, the same uh, if you look at, at, at the museum, institutions, yeah. Uh, the websites are CVs, yeah, actually. Important people, not important people, what happened, what kind of events, what kind of topics, yeah, and so forth. And you, 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 make this kind of, you make this kind of calculation. You make this calculations in your mind almost algorithmically. And so, <laughs> so it's like, like you have a small calculator in your mind, yeah, But there is no relationship to any object in that, yeah, it's a relationship to a legend. What you are confronted with is a narrative that it is a narrative always about, about the artist himself. So he's only here, yeah, there's no other heroes. It's a narrative, a legend about him. It's like a Ajax or I don't know, Zoe's uh, comes, to, comes to you and begins to, I make this one, I make this one, uh, so, yeah. It, 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 Thank you. Um, okay, should we open it up to Q&A?